Wow. Can you believe this is the last Sunday of 2020? This year can be summed up in two words, immense stretching. Friends, we have been stretched this year. But guess what? In the midst of all of the stretching, there has been great growth. So reflect on that. Friends, get ready because we look forward to a new year of new opportunities and new possibilities. And as we worship today, you center on that, the God who blesses us with new things, new years, and new opportunities. Let's worship together. Good morning, church, and welcome to worship. It's the third day of Christmas Tide as we join the church worldwide in celebrating Christ's coming to earth, celebrating by singing together, by praying together, and by listening to God's word faithfully read and faithfully preached. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice together and be glad in it. Beginning our worship this morning together by singing and offering our voices, O oh, come, all ye faithful. God's presence in our worship this morning. Join me as we pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Yea, Lord, we greet you, born this happy morning. You came to earth in a humble cattle stall, but all of God's angels heralded your coming, singing glory to God in the highest. You lived a sinless life. You sacrificed your own life for us, and you shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Come now, be with us now. Be our Emmanuel, for we ask it in your precious name, that name above all names, Jesus, our Jesus. Amen.
Well, surprise. No, boys and girls, it is time for the children's sermon. The surprise is that I'm the one giving it today. Miss Heather and I have been working for several weeks on this surprise, and here's what it's about. We are trading places today. I'm doing the children's sermon, so you can come on a little bit closer. And Miss Heather is going to be doing the sermon behind the pulpit today. Now, surprises can be uh, all kinds of fun or no fun at all. They can be good or bad. Like it might not have been a good surprise to you that I'm doing the children's sermon. You probably miss Miss Heather. And this year we've had some surprises that were not very much fun. Like when school didn't start back on time and you had to be away from your friends longer than you wanted. But sometimes surprises can be lots of fun, like, like Friday, Christmas Day, when I sat down and there were packages next to me wrapped with bows and with my name on it. And I had no idea what was in the package until I ripped it open and then the surprise. And it was often exactly what I wanted. So surprises can be very good or very bad. Lots of fun or no fun at all. But usually when there is a surprise, there is an opportunity for God to teach us something about God's love. Surprises get us off balance a little bit. And somewhere in that off balance, we can often learn something new about the love of God in Christ. Today, Miss Heather is going to be preaching about when Jesus was a baby and the surprises that Jesus' family encountered in his early days. And it was one surprise after another. But in surprise, we often learn something about God's love. So I hope you'll listen up carefully today to Miss Heather's sermon and look for the places of surprise. Let's pray together. Oh God, we are grateful for the many ways you have surprised us with your love, for happy things that happen to us that remind us that we are loved forever by you and your grace. And so God, we pray that in the rest of this time of worship, we might be aware that you love us and listen closely to Miss Heather's sermon to learn more things about Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.
Let's hear together a prayer written for this day. Would you pray with me? Lord, in this holy season of prayer and song, we praise you for the great wonders you have sent us, for the shining star and the angel song, for the infant's cry in the lowly manger. We praise you for the word made flesh in a little child. We behold his glory and are bathed in its radiance. Be with us as we sing the ironies of Christmas, the incomprehensible comprehended, the poetry made hard fact, the helpless babe who cracks the world asunder. We kneel before you with the shepherds, innkeepers, wise men. Help us to rise bigger than we are. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he'd been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Jesus, my rock and redeemer. Amen. What's next? It's a question that was frequently part of the television show The West Wing for the first several seasons. The West Wing was an award-winning show that chronicled the fictional presidency of Josiah Bartlett. President Bartlett, played by actor Martin Sheen, was famous for asking, what's next? Anytime he was ready to move on to a different topic or a different task with his staff. And each time he asked the question, what's next? His staffers would quickly pivot to something else that needed the president's attention. You see, asking what's next was President Bartlett's favorite way of moving on or moving forward. 
And as a young couple, my husband David and I, we really enjoyed watching the show The West Wing. We'd watch it together each week. This political drama created by Aaron Sorkin, it spanned seven seasons from 1999 to 2006. And as we watched the show week after week and season after season, <laughs> we grew up. We went from being a young, engaged couple to a slightly older married couple living in a new city, navigating the new of new jobs, and trying to figure out all these new grown-up responsibilities. Those early days of married life were fun. They really were. But they were also filled with a lot of challenges. It was a season of life that was full of mountains and valleys, of highs and low, as we tried to figure out how to make a life together. And to be honest, in the whirlwind of all this new life together, we were often left pivoting and asking, what's next? What's next, O oh Lord? And unlike actor Martin Sheen's character on the West Wing, neither one of us were looking to move on to something else. We were just, after all, starting our married adventure together. Instead, our question was born out of needing direction and guidance from above. Our what's next question was a way of prayerfully seeking what God wanted to do with us. How would God use us as a couple on this adventure of faith? Little did we know that God's next would mean something for us that we had never imagined. But God did. He knew all about it. He knew that he would one day call two mid-career professionals to ministry. He knew that he would send us to serve overseas. And he knew that even though we'd gone as a family of two, he would bring us back seven years later with a new daughter. God is full of surprises. And God's next for us was more abundant than we could even begin to imagine. In those early days of marriage, we asked, what's next? Again and again. And God brought something that was more abundant than we could have ever fathomed. What's next? It's a question that must have been on Joseph's lips just as soon as he awoke from a dream, visited by an angel with another message. What's next? Joseph must have wondered as he considered what running away to Egypt in the dark of night would mean for him, for Mary, and for Jesus. What's next? Joseph must have asked with his voice shaking. After all, he and Mary had already been through a lot, a lot of unusual challenges. And here the angel came visiting once again. At this point in the story, Mary and Joseph had already been through a lot as a young couple. They'd been rerouted and uprooted so many times. Yet in all of the ups and downs and uncertainties and all the what-ifs, they continued to trust God and to trust God's next for them and for their lives. From the time of the angel's first announcement to Mary, things had been different for them. Their plans for a typical engagement and a usual start to married life together were tossed aside as they surrendered to God's next for them. Then there was the long and arduous journey to Bethlehem, at the end of which Mary gave birth in a messy and smelly stable. I'm sure Mary and Joseph didn't imagine that this would be God's next for them or how God's only son would come into the world. Next, these new parents, Mary and Joseph, here they are tasked with protecting and providing for God's only son, Jesus. 
What a challenge for a young couple. Yet, they boldly accepted God's next for their lives. It must have felt like they were in a whirlwind of new. And all the while, Jesus keeps being recognized and attracting a lot of attention from the people around, many of which Mary and Joseph did not know. They witnessed the shepherds running in to worship Jesus the very night that he was born. They saw elderly Anna and Simeon recognize Jesus as the Messiah when they took him to the temple to dedicate him. Later, they were surprised by a visit from the wise men bringing kingly gifts to a newborn baby. It was a lot of new to navigate as a family. And as parents, they must have been exhausted. And they must have felt like they were waiting for the other shoe to drop. They must have been asking, what's next? What's next, O oh Lord? What does the future hold for us, for Jesus, for our family? And then as soon as the wise men left, Joseph had another dream. In this dream, the angel told, them, told him to take Mary and Jesus to Egypt so that they might escape the jealous wrath of Herod, who wanted to kill Jesus. The text tells us that Joseph got up and took Mary and the child by night to Egypt. No time to pack, no time to say goodbye, no time to question the logic of God's plan in sending them to a place where their people had once been enslaved. There was only time to run, to flee, in order to protect Jesus from the wrath of Herod. What's next, they must have wondered as they fled into the night. It must have been terrifying under the cover of darkness, looking around every corner to make sure they had safe passage as a family. I can imagine Mary tightly clutching Jesus in order to protect him as they lurked in the shadows, making their way through the night. With each step of the journey, they were watching and wondering and asking, what's next? What's next, O oh Lord? Once they arrived in Egypt, there was much to learn and so many things to arrange in order to establish their lives there. Imagine finding shelter, furnishings, food, and some sort of work to support the family when you didn't speak the language well. This was not easy for a young couple, for a young family. There were many challenges, and I'm sure they were left looking for direction from above. Thankfully, God was with Mary and Joseph in all of those moments, in all of those times when they asked, what's next? And they faithfully followed his lead, no matter how many times he rerouted them, no matter how many times he sent them in a new direction. This young couple in a whirlwind of new trusted God, and they were boldly leaning into and living out God's next for them. Mary and Joseph's obedience to God and his next in their lives is what protected Jesus when Herod's wrath turned truly deadly. Because Joseph listened to the angel in his dream, Jesus was safely in Egypt when Herod ordered the death of all male children two years old and under in Bethlehem. I imagine that mothers and fathers in the city of David cried and mourned the loss of their sons. And in the ashes of despair, I imagine that they too, with voices trembling, whispered, What's next? What's next, O oh Lord? And I wonder if the news of Herod's terrible death reached Egypt. I wonder... Did Mary and Joseph hear about the news and feel afraid again? 
Yet despite Herod's raid of terror, things eventually did settle down for the new family in Egypt. Their daily lives and some sense of routine came again. Things were a little more normal. That is, of course, until Joseph had another dream and God's next was revealed to Joseph again. In this new dream, Joseph learned that Herod had died and it was finally safe to go back to their homeland. The family made their way to Nazareth, boldly embracing God's next for them once again, trusting that God would protect them and provide for them this time too. What's next? We too understand this question, don't we? What's next? It's a question that's been on our lips all of 2020. As we've wondered what this year full of challenges would bring. And it felt so scary and unfamiliar and uncertain, didn't it? What's next, we cried, as we've dealt with heart-wrenching loss and grief this year. What's next, we wondered, as we sought for direction from above. In many ways, 2020 may have felt like the longest year of our lives. The chaos of this year, the events that have swirled on our television screens, in our communities, and yes, even in our homes, has been overwhelming. It's been a whirlwind of new experience that none of us wishes to repeat. Here are just a few of the things that we've been wrestling with and experienced this year. A worldwide pandemic that has killed far too many. Devastating unemployment and economic uncertainty that have left many in desperate need. Agonizing separation from family, from friends, from church family. Racial injustice and violence that caused both heartache and fear. Political division and acrimony that tore many relationships apart. Forest fires, hurricanes, tornadoes that caused death and destruction. Loneliness and social isolation. Virtual church, virtual meetings, virtual schooling. It's been a lot. Quick and unsettling changes to normal routines, to our schedules, and yes, even to long-standing family traditions. It's been a hard year. We've been through a lot. And with each new challenge this year, our hearts have asked, what's next? What's next, O oh Lord? What will the future hold? And if we're honest, if the answer's anything like 2020, maybe we don't want to go there. Yet in the midst of this hard year, God has taught us a lot. Like Mary and Joseph, we've learned the art of pivoting and holding things lightly. As much redirecting and rerouting and rearranging has been required of all of us. As followers of Christ, we have learned to lean into the promise that God will guide us, God will take care of us, and God will provide for us no matter what is next. We've learned to actively trust that God will be with us. For just as God made a way for Mary and Joseph to escape Herod's deadly wrath. God continues to make a way for us. Christmas reminds us of this. For our deliverer, Jesus, came. And he is the one who makes a way for us to move out of the wilderness of difficult times and to step bravely into God's next for us all. 
Singer and prolific composer Rich Mullins penned a beautiful song about the escape to Egypt. The lyrics of this song remind us that Jesus, our deliverer, is standing by. Here are just a few of the words from Mullins' song. Joseph took his wife and his child, and they went to Africa to escape the rage of a deadly king. There along the banks of the Nile, Jesus listened to the songs that the captive children used to sing. They were singing, My deliverer is coming. My deliverer is standing by. He will never break his promise. He has written it upon the sky. My deliverer is coming. My deliverer is standing by. Friends, our deliverer, Jesus Christ, came at Christmas. And we know that he will one day come again to make all things new. Yet even now, as we stand here between one year and the next, asking yet again, what's next? He is ready to give us direction. Even now, as we're standing between Christ's kingdom, which is already here but not yet fully realized, our deliverer is with us. He is standing by and ready to lead us forward. Our deliverer is here, and he's ready to walk with us as we look for and lean into God's next for us all. So as we're standing here just a few days away from a new year, are we open to God's next? Like Mary and Joseph were? Are we actively leaning into the promise that God will take care of us, even when he reroutes us into something that's unfamiliar? Do we believe that God's next is abundant? Or are we just ready to move on to another year that's not this year? Maybe a little of both. So what's next? Friends, I confess, I can't stand here and tell you what will happen next. But I know this to be true. To the core of who I am, I know that God is next. That's right, the great I am, he's what's next. And his plans for us individually and as a church family are more abundant than we can begin to even imagine. The great I am is who is next. And if we dig into scripture a little more, we remember that God's answered the question, what's next, so many times before. God faithfully answered the what's next question in the lives of Abraham and Sarah, in the lives of Moses, in the life of Samuel, in the life of David, and in the lives of countless others like Mary and Joseph. God has answered the question, what's next, through the prophet Jeremiah, saying, For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm to give you a future with hope. God has answered the question, what's next, through the prophet Isaiah saying, I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. He's answered the question, what's next, by sending his one and only son, Jesus, to teach us how to live, to show us how to love, and to deliver us from all our sins. And God continues to 
answer the question, what's next, in the lives of people all over the world today? Because God himself is next. The great I am is what's next. And he's the next that we need. Yes, the promises of God's abundant next is sure. And if we come and we're open to embracing God's next fully, he will deliver us into a season full of new vision, new purpose, new ministry. In challenging times, we know that God is next because we've experienced his love and his deliverance again and again and again. So as we stand here on the final Sunday of 2020 and prepare to turn the page, we are called to be people who look for and lean into God's next. Even if it feels uncertain, even if it comes with some challenges. For with faith in our deliverer Jesus, we like Mary and Joseph and so many others who've gone before us can step out in faith with bold and courageous feet, even if our voices are shaking. As we ask once again, what's next? What's next, O Lord? For I know this. We will hear an answer, even in the darkest times, that reminds us time and time again that God is next, and his abundant next for us all is exactly what we need. Join me as we close our worship in song, Joy to the World, the Lord is Come. As we close our time together today, I have three things to share with you. First, please remember that today we have another opportunity to worship together at 4 o'clock with our All Together service. Also, this Wednesday night, we will convene the Wednesday night prayer call. We got last week off, so this week we're expecting that many will dial in and pray with us together. 
And finally, please do remember that the church office will close at noon on the 31st and will remain closed for New Year's Day. And now, brothers and sisters, go, serving the Lord with gladness, remembering that your deliverer is standing by and that the great I am is who's next and he is all we need. Amen.
down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me Twenty has caused many of us to cry, many of us to know people who have died, many of us left heartbroken. We've seen numbers rise. We've seen fights and divisiveness, and it's left us crying out, wow, really? Hmm. Lord, we cry out to you even now on the last Sunday of this year, praying for better, asking that 2021 will be better than 2020. We cry out wow, really, because this phrase can signify happiness or it can signify a huge letdown. Truthfully, friends, we stand in anticipation this last Sunday of the year, hoping to be blown away by God's blessings in 2021. We hope for greater health. We hope for greater wealth. We hope for exciting times. We pray for beautiful comfort. I join you in this wonderful anticipation, but friends, we need to factor in something. 
We need to factor in that there will be some great times in 2021, but there will also be some challenging times in 2021. There will be times where we communicate, wow, really enjoy. And there will be some times where we communicate, wow, really in pain. But friends, we need to know that our beautiful Emmanuel will continue to be our God with us. Our beautiful Emmanuel is the reason that we stand here even today. Our beautiful Emmanuel is more than simply celebrating on the 25th of December. We serve a God who has keeping power. Friends, I want you to understand today that Jesus will continue to provide in abundance. He will continue to provide comfort even in the midst of pain. Jesus will blow our mind with abundant blessings, but offer hope in the midst of tribulation. Friends, we will be surprised in positive ways in 2021, but we will also be surprised in negative ways in 2021. But through this double entendre that can be life, we must trust that we have a co-pilot that travels everywhere with us, even gives us wisdom for every situation. You may ask Joshua, well, where are you getting this wild, really, phrase from? Well, it's screaming from the text of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. To give a bit of backdrop or background of the text, I want you to understand that these ancient believers were experiencing some fighting, some pain, and the feeling of hard work possibly going all down the drain. That's what my brother Paul, who writes this, is experiencing he sees these people experiencing this same thing. Paul is writing, if you hadn't caught it or not, he's writing to a quarreling church, a church that's experiencing pain at this time. Paul speaks about hellos. He talks about thank yous. Paul even talks about wisdom. But really, Paul is screaming to these believers in letter form. He's saying, hey, will you just grow up? Will you lay down your immaturity and just grow up? You see, Paul has a multitude of topics, but they can all be summed up to this quarreling church, even us. Just grow up. Friends, in 2020, if you hadn't caught it by now, we are a quarreling church. We're a church that fights just about everything. I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about the church universal we notice a world where hate-filled decisions have infiltrated and affected our lives. We find immaturity to be a norm and fighting and pain to be as frequent as water coming out of a faucet. Paul's letter to the quarreling church at Corinth has been postdated for all of us. It's postdated for us to reflect on today. You see, in a world that strikingly finds much similarity to Corinth, Paul's words offer us hope in these horrible moments. And this hope, it leaves us saying, wow, really? Hmm. Paul writes beginning at verse 6 through 8, and I like to sum it up just like this. Paul says that there's wisdom offered to all of us, but this wisdom is revealed by the Spirit. Listen to Paul's words in letter form. Paul writes, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Friends, I want you to catch this. Wisdom is something that we stand in desperate need of, but something that we very rarely pray for. You see, Paul, in the text, he writes to a spiritual community who is divided due to living in a province that promoted division. You see, Corinth was previously known as a Roman colony, but in its newer state, it morphed into and accepted more of a Greek influence. The idea of the resurrection of Jesus did not make sense to the Greeks. Whereas Paul was communicating to these believers that Jesus died, he was buried, and he was resurrected on the third day, and he now sits at the right hand of the Father. You see, in this province, there was the divide of Greek wisdom and spiritual wisdom. There was the divide of wrestling and wondering, should we stay with Jesus or should we be with the Greek gods and philosophers? And they did not know what 
to believe. Friends, I want you to catch this, that it's, it's awesome to have your Instagram evangelists and your YouTube philosophers. There's nothing wrong with that. But I want you to catch this, that if by chance you love their wisdom and it does not align with scripture, you've got a problem. Friends, because everything that we learn, all that we digest should be in line with scripture. I want you to catch this. God's not a man that he would lie. And his word always aligns with the wisdom that he reveals and that he gives. And so if we are going to have a blessed, no stress and lots of happiness in 2021, we must also pick up the word of God, be open to the wisdom that God reveals and walk directly in that wisdom. Friends, it's in verses six through eight where Paul is telling these divided believers, just trust in the wisdom revealed by the spirit of God. Trust in the wisdom that God has given us through the gospel of Christ. Paul says, I know, I know, I know, I know it may not align with the wisdom of the Greeks, but he's saying, I want you to catch this. There's a knowledge above college. There's a knowledge that comes from God that's not learned in a classroom. There's a knowledge that's higher than our affluency and also higher than our pride. There is a knowledge that's above even our rationale. <laughs> Friends, I want you to hear me. There's nothing wrong with going to school. I'm in school myself, but we should never make school our Christ. We should never make YouTube our, our God. We should never make Instagram our evangelist. Friends, catch this. I want you to know that God's word is the word that will lead you. It's the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. We have to understand that just because we can't rationalize it does not mean that it's not true. God is not confined to simply only what you can conceptualize. God gives wisdom sometimes that people don't even understand. We don't truthfully understand how Jesus was died and was raised again. We, we, we can't put ourselves in that moment because we are not divine, but that's where faith meets the rest of the way past your rationalization. Hmm. Friends, I want you to catch this. That this shows us that even though it's amazing to learn, it's amazing to be on social media, it's a great tool. We need wisdom to function in this life. Hmm. We need wisdom to know how to deal with a national pandemic. We need wisdom to know when churches, all of us can regather again. We need wisdom that comes from God to know how we can gather with our families again. So Thanksgiving in 2021 can look normal again. So Christmas in 2021 can look normal again. We need wisdom. We stand in the need of prayer. Friends, I want you to understand today that we need wisdom from God in our work relationships, in our friendships, in our family, in our relationships, in business partnerships. The wisdom of God created us and the wisdom of God saved us and the wisdom of God will provide for us. But you got to be mature to walk in this wisdom. In 2021, Paul is telling us in a post dated letter to right here to our hearts, we need maturity. And if by chance you think this is a, a thought that's just by itself, I promise the Bible sometimes, oftentimes echoes itself. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 5 verses 13 through 14 and hear these words. The anonymous writer says, anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Start now with a habit that you can carry over into 2021. Start praying for wisdom. We pray for every single thing else. We pray for new cars. We pray to lose weight. We pray for longer hair. We pray sometimes for peace. But when's the last time you've prayed for wisdom? Because see, wisdom will help you in living in such a divisive world. You see here, Paul in a letter, he's telling these people, he's saying, guess what? You need wisdom, but you also need unity. You will never be motivated to unify based on just your wisdom. Because on your wisdom, you're going to say, I love those who love me. On your wisdom, you're going to say, she didn't say hey to me this morning. I'm going to walk past her. You're going to say, he didn't do me right, so I'll never call him again. <laughs> but yet, when you have godly wisdom, you'll turn the other cheek sometimes. <laughs> you'll give grace instead of being divisive. You won't hold any more grudges. This is wisdom revealed by the Spirit. 
Friends, as I think about Paul's words to this ancient church, I've recently implemented a new practice that before I go into my house, I sit five minutes in the car. My dog goes to bark and Lauren looks out the window and wonders if I'm okay, if I'm sleeping there or something. But I'm sitting in silence. I'm not really trying to pray. I turn off my phone and this is what I do. I say, God, is there anything you want to say to me? For five minutes, sometimes longer, God speaks about some ways that I need to change in myself. Sometimes God reveals some sins that I've been overlooking. Sometimes he goes directly into a situation that I have been trying to avoid and offers me wisdom in how to handle it. You see, even in this time, we have to learn that if we're ever going to become mature, this is what Paul is saying. You got to learn how to spend time with God above everything else. Paul, in the text, he's sharing that in the midst of division, in the midst of all of this chaos, he's saying, will you submit to God so that God can give you wisdom revealed by the Spirit? Mm. Friends, I'm convinced that one of my mentors told me that many of us suffer from just giving out too much dialogue. In the words of James Brown, we talk loud and say nothing. Sometimes we need to learn how to be quiet, ask the question of God. God, will you show us what to do? And God will. Mm. Friends, this is what Paul is saying in the text. He's saying God will reveal the wisdom if you are willing to follow the wisdom that he reveals. But yet it's in verses 9 through 10. We find Paul's anticipatory words and we sum them up just like this. In 2021, start now, we can expect greatness from God. <laughs> it's the secular theologian T.I. Hmm, who once said, I don't want no, the I don't want no mediocre. Hmm, and I want you to catch this. God doesn't either. Hmm. God doesn't function in mediocre. God doesn't bless in mediocre. God doesn't give us any mediocrity. But here's the truth. If he doesn't give us any mediocrity, why do we give him mediocrity? Hmm. Hmm. It was in 1792 that adds a layer to this great theological sandwich that William Carey, the great missionary, quoted saying this, expect great things from God, comma, attempt great things for God. Hmm. See the twofoldness there? Hmm. You see, this should be our perspective in 2021, that we move forward in hope, trusting the greatness that comes from God. But when we trust that great, when we expect that great, we must in turn be ready for the responsibility to actually live out that greatness. Hmm. It's James, the half brother of Jesus, that once said that to whom much is given, much is required. Therefore, start something now spilling over into 2021. Don't seek to just exist, but seek to thrive. No matter your age, no matter your stage of life, no matter what you got going on, you want to thrive. You want to live into your purpose. God has given you great things, but will you attempt the great things that God is leading you to? It could be a new job. It could be starting a business. It could be getting out of a relationship. It could be being more diligent in school. It could be being more diligent in your health. It could be praying more. It could be letting some people go. But whatever it is, God is giving you greatness. Will you attempt great things for God? I love what Paul is saying here in verses 9 through 10 because we love, we love to add and tag this type of text with nothing but prosperity. But I love what this text is showing us because it's more than happiness and a feat like good time. But instead, it's overflowing with responsibility. Hmm. <laughs> Look at verse nine. The text says, however, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things. Watch this. Even the deep things of God. All right. Listen to this, friends. These beautiful, hopeful words, they are a paraphrase of some earlier words given by Isaiah, the prophet. But when times are tragic, divisive, and rough, we don't care where hope came, comes from. We just want hope to come. See, Paul, in a letter he affirmed that in all of life, we can expect greatness from God. 
Paul is writing to these believers at Corinth as well as us. He's saying, you know, I know you live in a racially diverse, economically diverse, theological diverse environment because we both are there. He says, but in all of this difference, I'm writing to let you know that you can expect that, that God, Emmanuel, will walk with you. You can expect that you don't have to be divisive. You could function in unity. He's telling them right here as well as us, lay down the immature fights. He's telling them as well as us, stop fighting over politics. It doesn't matter if you are a Democrat or a Republican. Do you love the one that died for you named Jesus? It doesn't matter whether you want to wear your mask or not. I hope you will. But do you love Jesus? It doesn't matter if you are Methodist or if you're Kojic. Do you love Jesus? Paul is telling them as well as us, will you stop fighting and start having faith? Will you stop fighting about every single thing? Because in 2021, if we are so excited about what's going to happen, maybe then God has given us greatness, but will we attempt the great things of unity? Will we attempt the great things of racial reconciliation instead of just talking about it in a committee meeting? Will we attempt the great things for God that we literally will put God over our everything, over our baseball games, over our football games? Will we pray to God instead of picking up our cell phone in the morning? Will we make time for God instead of giving God excuses? Because if God has given us these great things, it's time for us to live out and attempt those great things. These are not just my words. I promise it's biblical. It's in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where the text says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Watch this, for good works that we, responsibility, should walk in them. Hmm. Friends, we can't walk into the new year with old tendencies. We can't put old wine in new wine skins. If we're going to have a blessed 2021, check this, it's not based on the pandemic ending or not. I promise it's not hmm. because the pandemic can keep going. But the, the question that we're raising from this text is, will your faith still keep thriving? The pandemic can keep going, but will you believe that the Lord will fight your battles if you just stand still? The pandemic can keep going, but will you trust that the Lord is a promise keeper, a way maker, a miracle worker? The pandemic can keep going, but will you trust in the one that will make your path straight? The pandemic can keep going, but will you believe that God will do every single thing that he said he will do? We put too much power in this pandemic. Too much power. <laughs> because it wasn't but more than a few months ago that every church in America had 2020 vision. Can you still see? Because God made it clear that eyes have not seen. <laughs> nor ears have heard, nor enter into the heart of man. God's master plan for those who love him in this year. Yes, people have died. Yes, tragedy has knocked on our door. Yes, we have lost people, but we have also found that on Facebook on Sunday morning, <laughs> there are more churches talking about Jesus than ever before. On YouTube right now, you are finding people who are coming to Christ right now. Friends, I know the pandemic is bad. It's affected my home greatly, but I'm trying to tell you something. You can expect great things from God <laughs> because God through Jesus told Peter that upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell would never prevail against it. Friends, could it be that God is using even in our tragedy to get us closer to him? Could it be that God is literally saying, I know what you're going through. I know you've lost a lot, but you can gain a lot if you will give me your heart. Could it be that God is working this thing out and it just don't look the way we thought it would look? Friends, this is a mature word. It stepped on my toes first before it may have stepped on yours. But if by chance you say, I don't know what that man's talking about. <laughs> he's talking about wisdom revealed by the spirit. I don't know about that because we need a whole lot of wisdom. He's, he's talking about expect great things from God. Well, I've been expecting God to do something in my life and it hadn't worked out. Well, go over to Galatians 1, verses 11 through 12, because Paul, too, had some doubters. Paul told a whole nother group of believers in Galatia these words. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man or woman, I was, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Friends, that's wisdom. 
If you want to know how to live in 2021, how to receive the miracles that God's going to give you, you need wisdom. Friends, God has not moved just because tragedy strikes. God is still right here with us. He loves us. He's rocking with us. And he's just waiting on us to stop finding new ways to fight with each other. So into the newness that God offers, will you trust him? In 2021, will you stop making empty resolutions and start making brand new habits? In 2021, will you stop letting what's so around you affect your faith and start allowing what's in you to drive your faith? That's my hope. Because then verse 9 and 10 can have the prosperity tag that we align with it. Eyes have not seen. No ears have heard, no enter into the heart of man. God's master plan for those who love him. God loves us. He loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for us. He loves us so much that we can expect great things from God even in a troubled world. But it's time for us, friends, to take the leap of faith, to put down divisiveness, pick up where, roll around, and walk in unity. I challenge each of you in 2021 to do just that. We don't need more hatred. We need more unity. That's Paul's sentiment. And I echo that. In this new year, I want to pray with you. Because I know we have no clue what will occur. We may say, wow, really, and be surprised and everything may be well. Or we may say, wow, really, oh, my God, more of this. But let's pray. Mm. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, 2020 has been a year unprecedented. It's been a year where we've lost much, but we've gained some things. And so even now, we lift up those who have lost their lives to this pandemic. We lift up the families who are dealing with those losses, Lord. We pray for comfort. We pray for peace. We ask, God, that you would place a hedge of protection around each and every one of us. Help us, God, to trust you. We pray, Lord God, for every church in America, that every church would walk and live in unity instead of division. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on our world. Fall fresh on our homes. Fall fresh on our health. Fall fresh on our wealth. Heal our land, Lord. We need you. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. If by chance, friends, you are watching this and you don't know Jesus. Friends, you don't have to make a resolution. All you have to do is repeat a prayer right where you are. That prayer goes like this. Would you repeat it? I admit that I need Jesus. I believe that Christ died on the cross for my sins. And I confess that Jesus is the Lord of my life. In Christ's name, amen. Friends, if you just prayed that prayer, we want to know about it. If you have any other prayer requests, we may be scattered, but we are not alone and neither are you. You let us know about it by emailing altogether at spdl.org. If you'd like to sow into this ministry, you can go to spdl.org, the given options there, and under that drop-down menu is the option for all together, and you can give as God leads you. Friends, I want you to know that God's with us still, even though we have a Christmas hangover going on. But I want you to know that as we take the Christmas tree down and the garland from around the rails, we can still be happy about the Emmanuel, who is our God with us. So this week, as we prepare to leave this virtual space, I'm charging you, seek God. Seek the wisdom from God. Expect greatness from God and attempt great things for God. I hope you will. And hey, have a great 2021. We'll see you again in January. <laughs>